What is up you guys? It is Monty and today I'm back again once again with the start of another video and today, this week, however long it's going to take, I'm going to be reading Babel, uh, The Necessity of Violence, An Arcane History of the Oxford Translators Revolution, I think. I think I got all of it in there, but if I didn't, I didn't. It's written by R.F. Kwong. It is their latest release and um, if you're watching this, that means we are close to the release date or or you've gone to my description, you've clicked on the Patreon, and you've become a patron, and you got this months and months in advance. Either way, thanks for clicking on to it, and uh, let's get into it. As of now, I am about 20 or so percent in. Maybe it's actually a little less. Let's not lie to the people. It's probably less. It's probably closer to like 15 percent. 17. I'm on chapter 5, which is the start of book 2 of this and I figured that at the conclusion of book one that's as good a time as any to come in update you guys I'm reading the eARC version of this so I don't know how many parts there are going to be I don't know when book two is going to end but um either you know around 50 percent or the end of book two whichever comes first is probably I'm update you guys again so far this is another <laughs> single perspective narrative but there's I don't know there's something about Robin that it's uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm open to enjoying Robin. Um, but as of right now, he feels like the most passive member of this group. So it's going to be interesting to see if he becomes a more active participant in the narrative or how his passivity is going to play into that. Or uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, at the beginning of the book, we he see his family is all dying of cholera and he is adopted slash kidnapped slash saved, however you want to look at this, um, by Professor Lovell, who is an English person, and he arrives, he takes him, and we, we are getting a lot of Robin's um, difficult, I don't know if I actually would call it difficulties adjusting to life in England, but you get to see this dichotomy of trying to be the person that uh professor Lovell wants him to be and the person that he thinks he is supposed to be and you we've really had a lot of these like really interesting moments with robin where the english society is doing things that both make him feel welcome and accepted but at the same time this understanding that what they're saying is like very much not the whole truth there was a scene where he he just got to meet the head of like the the institute for translation or whatever and the professor person is like telling him the story and we get to see robin and he's like oh yeah i've never felt so welcome but i've also read the story that he was referencing and those people that he's comparing us to were like very much slaves so it's like this dichotomy that i think is very baked into a lot of the interactions that robin has where you get to see this duality of the acceptance but also that the acceptance is very much conditional on what robin can do for this professor it's not like oh we like you we like you it's we like you because you can do something for us and the ways that you can benefit us and the ways that you are useful is why you are accepted in this space so it's really interesting it's definitely a lot of the i don't know if it's actually fair to say it's a lot of the conversations that i was really enjoying from the burning god because they are separate conversations for sure and i'm just i i am enjoying that of the burning god but i do think that <laughs> there is an the audience for those like really deep philosophical conversations like I, I don't I don't know if that audience is large um, and maybe the audience will be larger than I'm giving it credit for but at first thought like it's not this isn't the kind of book that I would be like oh yeah if you read The Poppy War if you've read R.F. Huang's other books then you're also going to enjoy this uh, depending on the things that you enjoyed about it. So it's interesting for sure. We're, I, I am happier now that we have left 
London because for a while after Professor Lovell came and got Robin and like made Robin change his name and we only know Robin really as Robin um <laughs> after all of that he went to like the the London countryside and he was getting there was a scene where he got beat and he was like forced to learn uh Greek and Latin and all these other things that were happening there um, now that we're actually in Oxford and we've met the rest of the cast of characters that were teased with the initial, I think there was like fan art, or I guess it's official art, um, of our core characters, like we finally met all of them, um, and I like all of them <laughs> a lot, and I like seeing Robin fitting into this and the larger conversations that are at play because he is there, um, uh, they're there and they have like this very similar things i do want to say i do want to say that the fact that all three of the non all three of the people of color in this in this little friend group all three of them were brought to europe by some random white person it's giving sketch i think that this is definitely going to play into the narrative a lot later and so many of the people at babel are also people of color so far i do want to say that it's only i mean professor Lovell is a white man and he's teaching like East Asian languages or something um, at the college and then Letitia who was a white a white girl they're the only kind of I think maybe Professor Playfair is also white um, but so many of the other like postgraduate graduate students who are working in the Institute are people of color it's very interesting it's de and I knew that going in it was going to be again a lot of conversations about how people of color are utilized as tools in the machine of white supremacy and uh, colonial expansion and imperialistic forces. So that's all that's all things that I was ready and willing to, to go into. But I do think um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And that's all I have to say about the first part of the book so far. I'm intrigued. My interest is piqued. I am excited and looking forward to continuing on for the rest of this book. But as of what I've read right now, it's very... Yeah. And I do think that um, in a lot of the, I need to stop saying it, I think, but after I finished uh, The Writing God and before I started reading Babel in that space, I watched like pretty much every lecture that R.F. Kuang has ever given that is available on YouTube. So like panels and discussions and things that I could find, I've watched. And um, the further away we got from the release of The Burning God and, like, the closer to, like, the present time that I was watching it in January, December, February, February of 2022, the more it felt that R.F. Kuang didn't seem to think that she could, I don't know if she, I don't know if I would actually argue that she didn't think she could, but she didn't know how useful it was to use fantasy to tell the kind of stories that she was writing, um, and have the kind of conversation she wanted to have. And I do think that even though fantasy, like the, the magical elements of the Poppy War series were minimal, I do think that they were still, there. It, 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 it's still larger there than they are here. And even as they try to explain how the magic system works in Babel, I do think on some level, without the magic system, at least where I'm at now, um, this book could have been a little more interesting, but I am willing to see if that changes because of how the magic is incorporated. Um, you can, I understand why the magic system works the way it does in Babel. I just don't know if I really care about the magic overall. So I do hope that as the story goes forward, the magic and why it's, uh, here will start to, or not, not necessarily why it's here but i hope that the magic um does have some kind of significant role over the course of the rest of the story as i do also hope that this person that robin has gone to the twisted group to meet for the first time after their little initial run-in i'm hoping that this is what i think it is because i'm kind of here for that element of the story too which i didn't know about going in so i'm gonna go i'll check back in once i've read uh, to either the end of book two or 50%, whichever comes first. But um, I'm excited. Also, going forward, uh, there probably will be spoilers. So this is probably the most spoiler-free you're going to get. I will leave timestamps down below. So when I start doing my final thoughts and wrap-up, um, you can just skip ahead to the final thoughts and wrap-up, and you can not worry about me spoiling anything for you. So I'll see you guys a little bit in the future.
this is probably the most embarrassing I have ever felt filming an update because I just spent the last 15 minutes of my last reading sprint trying to update you guys. Spoiler alert. Um, I had had a reading comprehension error and had to scrap it. So here I am in the next sprint trying to compensate for what I didn't read in the last one. And I get to the end of book two, which means I have to come back here and update you guys. So in the time that we've been apart, I have been proven incorrect about my theory. I'm going to tell you guys my theory because I was wrong. I thought that what I was about to read was Robin from the future coming to talk to Robin in the present. And he was going to like give him all this information. And there's going to be like this big, oh my goodness. Why did I think that? I don't know. I don't know. Couldn't tell you, but it was stupid. It's also <laughs> not even like close to what happens. Instead, it was just Robin's older brother, Griffin, because spoiler alert, this was not the first time that Professor Lovell had done this bullshit. He decided to impregnate somebody from China and then go and take the baby, but only in the case of the first time uh, he took Griffin too soon. And so Griffin doesn't dream in Cantonese or in Mandarin, but he can speak it fluently. And so for the magic to work, you kind of have to like dream in all of these languages. They have to be like a part of your essence, if ooh, part of your essence, if you will. And so eventually Robin and Griffin come to an understanding where Robin is gonna help Griffin out, even though it makes him a little uncomfortable, but it, it doesn't put him in any kind of like real, danger until it does and the moment that robin is in like real actual danger you can definitely see him start like those early hesitations and, re and reticencies uh come back to the surface a lot of part two is a lot of their three years at the their first three years studying at Babel and they're just kind of going through it and kind of experiencing life and we kind of continue to see um in even more ways how the students of Babel are supporting the empire and how the specifically uh victoire victory victory whatever her name is uh rami and robin because they are the minority students in the institution in this little cohort and so we get to see how they are from these oppressed parts of the british colonies of their little like spheres of influence because, you know, China was not a British colony, but, you know, in their little, their, their ways or whatever, because we, there's also lots of discussions about how uh, languages it, it, sort of popular on the European continent are sort of not as powerful or they are, there's this fear that they won't work so well in the silver magic that they do in comparison to all of these like more far flung let's say which also just reeks of you know questionable little racism on my part but these these other languages that aren't necessarily associated with the european continent if you will um and so we get to see a lot of looks into that we get to look really heavily into the stratifications within the like Babel is what dark academia is supposed to be not only am i learning about actual like just words like just the act of translating and the thought processes and the care and the effort that goes into that but also just in like etymology and in the history and the the way that all of these things play in and play against one another and play off of one another all of that but it is also just a really <laughs> just intense in-depth look at the the sort of class stratifications and racial uh and how, and how race plays into that in this not only in large society but within the academic institutions at a period in time when so much of the literature just would actively just not engage with either uh, the class issue or the race issue or how those two commingle and it's just it's everything that i want from dark academia and i feel like there was a a time where dark academia just got co-opted by like these little murder plots and how everything is dark because of the murder and we're going to like romanticize uh, you know the the exhaustion that comes with being in academia and here it just feels very 
real and it's giving me everything that I want from the genre, from something that's calling itself Dark Academia. And I just have to applaud, again, RF Kong's mind because it really is like I'm back sitting in the burning god and she's giving me all of these like really just big brain, large, you know, thematic political narratives and we're back there. And so, like, that's the the correlation that I'm getting. And it's the only and the, the political discussions and the philosophical philosophical discussions and the the meanings of all of these things are why I was so excited to pick up Babel. And so for me, it is definitely hitting on it's firing on all cylinders. For the average reader, for the people who are out there in the world who just really liked, you know, her first series. I don't know if this is for them. I don't know the actual appeal of this kind of a story for people who say they like, um, who say they like a a dark academia because it it it, it is what I think the genre should be, but is so often not. I feel like that's where I'm falling. But I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this little discussion here. I'm currently sitting at around forty percent, so I'll definitely be back at the fifty percent mark. Um, and if the end of book three happens before then, great, but I, I don't foresee that being the case. This bitch had it coming, and I know that that's a horrible way to start off this little section of the video, but this bitch had it coming. I'm currently at 57%, which is a little bit past the 50% mark, but it works out because I finished book three and about to start book four um, in this little situation, so I just have a little bit over, uh, you know, what is it, like 43% of the book left, and I am eating this up. I tweeted earlier, like five minutes before I sat down to discuss this, that around the same time uh, last year, I was reading Jade Legacy. I think I read Jade Legacy in May of 2021, and we're at the beginning of April, um, and I'm reading Babel, and I think that both books are going to fuck me up for the rest of the year. When I read Jade Legacy, it took me months, like actual months of reading some really good books honestly but also just some mediocre ones in order to fully get over just how much I love Jade Legacy. I read that book and every book I finished after that I was like well it was good but was it Jade Legacy? And <laughs> I think that I'm going to be doing the same thing. It's like this book was good but was it Babel? Like, was it Babel, though? Like, was it? And the answer is going to be no. It's not going to be Babel. Um, so I hate that for me. I love that for the people. But as for what has happened, we discovered that Victoire, Victoria, I don't know. She's the little, the little Haitian girl. And Rami were both also in, involved in the Little Hermes Society, the Hermes Society. Um, that Griffin was in and he kind of brought Robin in, but Robin was like kind of reluctant to be in it. We found out that those two were in it and then we found out that they were going to get caught. And so Robin did what he needed to do and he kind of got them out of that sticky situation. But that wound up um, him having to betray one of the safe houses. And so with that betrayal um, out of the way or whatever, we also learned that they were going to go on their little study abroad trip and they were going to go to Canton. And that's mostly uh, what I was just reading. So the four students that we follow and Professor Lovell got on board this little steamship, this little sailing boat, and they sailed themselves to China where shit hit the fan. Um, because they were supposed to be there for several months and they were supposed to, um, help with the translation stuff that was happening at, like, in, in the Canton office. Um, and so they were there and Robin was supposed to help one of the, the tradesmen that was in, in the, in the city or whatever, get the, you know, officials to let the British sell opium because that's literally the only thing that the British have to offer the Chinese. They're like, you guys like this, right? Like, you'll you'll get high. Like, we can offer you this. Because otherwise, they have no goods that the Chinese want. Only the Chinese don't even want the opium. They're like, this is, this is shit. Like, you guys don't even sell this to your people. And there was, like, this whole big scene about it. And it ended with, you know, the Chinese officials going like, yeah, we're just going to stick to following our laws. And if y'all try to keep doing this, we're going to, 
we're going to confiscate the opium, we're going to burn the opium, and we're going to behead everybody on the ship. Which feels a little dramatic, but you know what? Good on them. The original war on drugs. And so <laughs> that happens, and Professor Lovell is enraged. He is like, bitch, what did you say? Robin, what did you do? And we finally get this moment where Robin and Professor Lovell have a, conf a confrontation that is kind of spurred on by the fact that the Chinese officials in the city, they go to where the opium is being held and they destroy it. And so the Babel students leave with Professor Lovell. And so this confrontation between uh, Robin and the professor happens on the boat. And I've been waiting for this. I have been waiting for this confrontation to happen. And we get so many good jabs. We get so many good moments between these two characters. And Robin is finally not being this meek person. He's finally like, you know what? This is my moment. Probably not going to get another one of these. I'm going to make the most of it. And he really does. He lets Professor Lovell have it. He is dragging this man for filth. Dragging him for filth. Oh, we had already seen in Canton, like in while Robin was at Oxford in England, there was a lot of times where he was facing just like really overt racism and was just like water off a deck's back, right? But when he is in Canton, the city of his birth, and these Englishmen are looking at him like you're not Chinese though, like we're going to use all these little slurs. We're going to talk about the Chinese people all these kinds of ways. Even though Robin is sitting right there going, yeah, but I'm also Chinese. And the man is like, mm, but you're not. You're not Chinese. And so the same thing is kind of happening on the boat. And Robin is like up to here with it. He is done. He's like, no, bitch. No, bitch. I, I actually am Chinese. And I'm going to need you to put some respect on my name. And if you don't, you're going to catch these hands. And Professor Lovell, he was not ready for the hands. He was not ready for the hands. He didn't want the smoke. And Robin gave it to him. And when I was reading it, I said this bitch had it coming. He had it coming. Cell block tango was running through my head. Because I had been waiting from jump for this confrontation to happen. And to read about it, chef's kiss. Chef's fucking kiss. It, it was everything I wanted it to be. It was everything I didn't know I needed it to be. It was just... The Shining Beacon on a Hill. That's what it was. It was The Shining Beacon on a Hill. She did the damn thing. And for the rest of the book, I'm going to be thinking about how good that moment was. Um, I don't really... I still don't know where this is going to go. I think that as the story has gone on, we've definitely laid some more groundwork for this apparent revolution to happen. We've definitely seen Robin in particular become more... I don't want to use the word radicalized because I do feel like it has a certain connotation, but we do see him becoming more willing to do things that I don't think he would have been willing to do um, at the beginning of the book. Like what he just did, the confrontation between him and the professor would not have happened at the beginning of the book. So I'm excited to see where this goes for him. And I'm happy that we got this moment and I'm excited to see where the rest of this goes. But bitch... I'm calling it. I'm calling it. I think that Babel, uh, what is it? The necessity of violence, uh, the the, an arcane history of the Oxford Translators Revolution. I think it's going to be my number one book of the year. Um, I think I'm, I think it's going to be, and I will be purchasing my copy from Blackwell's because the UK cover I think is just better, even though it's very similar to the US. I do think that um, with all the mentions of like the silver working and, you know, silver being a big part of the magic system, I think that that cover just makes more sense to purchase and to have on your shelf than the cover with gold on it. That seems like a very bizarre choice to me, and I don't really understand what HarperCollins was going with there, but they didn't ask me, so I guess it's okay. This is horrible lighting, but you know what? It is what it is. I'm at 77% and book four just happened to end around 76%. So I don't feel too bad. As for what is happening, RF Kwan is destroying it. She is systematically going for every character that I care about <laughs> and doing the absolute most to them. And I am not okay. I don't like it. I want... <laughs> I want it to stop. I need it to stop because there ain't enough book left for these characters to keep going through it.
the way that they are. However, I am enjoying it. Is this the best book I have ever read? Maybe. Maybe. But Babel... Babel is that bitch. But Babel is taking it to another level. Like, I don't think there's a single page in this book that we are not unpacking colonialism. We're not unpacking the horrors of empire. We're not unpacking something. We're, there's not a page in this book where we are not digging in and having these really like granular discussions and I am eating them all up. It has been four, I haven't highlighted a book this much since Permanent Record. Permanent Record is probably my actual favorite book of all time. And is this unseating, is this unseating Permanent Record? Maybe. Maybe. I don't think the Art of Kwong is replacing Mary as my favorite author because Rebecca's only given me two bangers and Mary's given me three. But it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about. As for what's actually happening, we had this whole lovely little scene with, uh, what is her name? Fucking Letty. That white devil. This bitch came into the into the little show and she started doing the most. She started doing the most. She was giving pure white feminism. And she was like, I'm going to save them. I'm going to save these colors from themselves. And like, I saw it coming because that's who that bitch would be. But at the same time, I was like, nah, she ain't going to do that. And she's doing it. And that's really what y'all missed. I mean, there's been a lot of other developments that have really been hitting me hard. Luddy being the white savior bitch, she's trying to, she pulling the white feminist, she pulling the Karen. That was upsetting, particularly because of an action she did while she was being a fucking Karen. But her being a Karen isn't what's like actually distressing to me. So I'm going to go because this lighting is actually horrendous and I would like to eat dinner at a reasonable time. But this book is putting me through it. RF Kong is that bitch. She's doing the damn thing. And I know you guys have this pre-order. I don't have to tell you guys to pre-order it this time. But it's the best book of 2022. It really is. It's that it's that girl. It's that spoiler alert. It's gonna be it's gonna be on the best of. Spoiler. Spoiler. And it won't even be like a tie. I know for like the past couple of years there's been a tie. I'm like, oh, I really like both of these things. Hands down, Babel is head and shoulders better than any book. I read in 2022. The year's not even close to being over. We're barely a third of the way into this bitch. But she already, she already that girl. She already unseated. She is, she has taken the crown. We are once again in my car. I am finished with the book, but there is going to be um one more clip after this where I can sit down and have people jump if they don't want to be spoiled just yet. So you haven't seen the last of me, which is why I feel comfortable filming in my car before I go to Starbucks. This book absolutely destroyed me. I do have a really, I want to call it a really big issue. I do want to call it a big issue, but in, in the context of the story and in the scheme of things, I don't know how big the issue really is. And I don't know if my criticism of what I'm about to talk about is actually fair. So before I get into anything else, I wanted to say that. Because I do want to start off with my issue. And so Babel is told from a singular perspective. We get Robin's point of view for most of the book. I say most of the book because before, at some point, which I told you guys about, we got Rami's perspective. And then I want to say it was in book four, we got a moment, an interlude with Letty's perspective. And we really got to see her being a full Karen. We got to see the Karen mind at work. And so we know there's four characters. And the entire time, you know, I'm reading the book. And at first I was like, okay, we just had Rami. So it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get Letitia or Victory. Victoire. I don't know this woman. I'm sorry. I need to Google. I didn't know we were going to get either one of their, their perspectives. And then we got Letty's. And I was like, okay, so we had two, we had three, I've had now three of the four main characters and two alternate perspectives. 
And as the end of the book is approaching, I am like, where is Victoire Victory's perspective? Where is it? Because homegirl deserves to have the perspective. And she does. She does get a perspective. At the very end of the book, the epilogue is told from her point of view. And this is the issue that I have. So going into the end of the book, we know that the stakes are high. We know at this point that Professor Lovell is dead, that Professor Lovell was working in concert with all these other characters, these other people, these men, to have Britain go to war with China under the pretext of fair trade, where really what they wanted to do was sell the Chinese people opium, because that's all they could do, that's the only good that they had. And even though they wouldn't sell it to their own people, they were, you know, racists. And so selling it to the Chinese was something they were willing to accept, willing to do, if it meant access to a greater silver store. And that's what they were going to do. So they were going to go to war under this false pretext of fair trade so they could really just seize control of the silver that they wanted. Because that's the driving force behind all of Britain's empire. And so... We know that he's dead. We know that the students know this. They have worked really hard to um, to cover up not only his death, but then they get back to England. And so now they know they can't really go back to Babel because they're going to be caught because they killed this man on a boat. When I say they, I mean Robin. He killed this man on a boat. So it's not even like, you know, the stakes were high. And then they got into the see they went back to the secret society that had been introduced earlier in the book. And so we got to see Griffin again and we got to see Anthony again. And we got to spend some more time with other translating students who were there who were also in the secret society. And then we saw that society get infiltrated and bombed. And we got to see Rami die. And I'm still mad at that bitch Letitia. She can catch me outside. And so now we are inside Babel. Victory. And Robin have... I'm also a little bitter that we don't... I don't think we ever got a scene where we know Robin's true name. I know at the beginning of the book, he said something, and then Professor Lovell was like, no Englishman can pronounce that, give me something else. So, like, his name is Robin Swift, but that was not really what he was born as. And when he dies, he doesn't envision himself as that. Because there's a scene in his death where he is like like he sees the face of his mother and his mother calls him his actual name but the reader doesn't actually get that and I do feel a little cheated but so much of Robin has been forcibly taken from him and so him keeping that to himself maybe there's like some meaning there but anyway that's beside the point so Victory and Robin and some of the remaining translators who are in Babel um decide to they're going to side with victory and robin and everyone else is forcibly expelled from the tower and they are holed up in here trying to convince parliament to block the vote on going to war and as the days start going by they start doing things that forces parliament's hands like they are actively doing things that are kind of destructive like definitely this is not the the revolution is not peaceful and good on them for that you know good on them personally I don't know if I would have the stomach for it either, but reading about it, I said, yes, bitch, do the thing. And so we're reading about it, and they're doing these things, and as the time keeps going, we are understanding that some of the people are starting to get a little less comfortable with what is happening. Like, they want this to happen, but they don't really know if they agree with the means. So there's a schism, and again, some people leave, and by some people, I think it's like really just like two people ultimately decide that they are going to leave and they are not because the final decision when they realize that they can do nothing to stop this that they that um parliament is not going to side with them what they decide to do is destroy the tower which you know is kind of symbolic i guess because you know biblical tower of babel fell this tower of babel is going to fall it's like again like the layers in this book the the way that rf kwong is asking the reader to interact with this text I think is commendable is just top tier writing just top tier writing hands down best book I've read this year hands down the best book I'm going to read this year possibly the best book I've ever read in my entire life I told y'all this last night in my car I think but when the tower falls the two people who leave I think it's Professor Kraft who is a white woman she leaves 
and victory. Victory says, you know, I don't think that I should have to die in order for this to happen. And there was, she had some really great lines. I don't know if they're going to make it into the final book, but there's a, like, there's a final moment between Robin and Victory, and they're having this heart to heart because it's been them, you know, it's these two have been through everything. And Victory knows that Robin ultimately was always going to do this, but she was staying by his side up until this moment. Up until this moment, they were there. And having the perspective be from Victory, from the Black woman, who is determined to carry on the revolution and find these people that uh, Griffin told her still... I mean, Griffin tried to tell Robin in his little, like, last letter uh, to find these three people. Um, and so, like, hope is not dead, even though Babel has fallen. The purpose of Babel, like, the tower being destroyed, even though there had been you know, there are people who exist in this world who are still translators, right? Like, who still have a breadth of knowledge, but all of the, the match pairs, all of the record keeping, like, the central tower being destroyed, and all of the silver in that tower was, is it was a big deal. Like, so it's not just like, oh, well, you know, Monty, you told me that all these people left the tower. Leaving, like, people being out of the tower don't matter. The, all the important shit was still in the tower. So the tower being destroyed was actually a really big deal, even though there were hundreds of thousands of people around the world who can continue on doing the work. But Victory being the person who was like the black girl who was still riding through the woods trying to continue the revolution, there's something about that that does leave a bad taste in my mouth. It just, I don't know, there's something about like the weight of that that feels, I don't know if I say it's like disproportional, but it does, I don't know. I don't know how I, I don't know how to feel about it. Like, there's something about, like, the expectation that, of course, victory would continue on, and, you know, continue on with Griffin's mission to find these people and, like, continue doing the work to uh, undo the seeds of Britain's imperial might and shit. And so it's like, I appreciate it. I like it. I get it. I got it. We're good. It doesn't ruin the book for me. Um, because it is still the best book I read this year, still probably the best book I read my entire life. But I do wish that we had got Victory's perspective earlier in the book. Because even though I was happy that she died, when we were getting the epilogue from her, I just wanted something else. Uh, even though her perspective was definitely in line with the other two interludes that we got from Rami and Letitia, although there was also like a, a third interlude where uh, a significant event was happening uh, that was kind of like the turning point for everyone in Babel realizing that, okay, if that was the trump card and nothing changed, then we have to do something even bigger. And this is the, our final stand. That was also an interlude. And so like that was interesting to read. But of the, like the three other character interludes, I was like, I really wish this was something else. And I do think that Babel confirmed for me that I I don't know if I want multiple perspectives from RF Kuang. When I was reading the Poppy War, I definitely did. But here, I don't know if I needed them because while the interludes definitely underscored particular character attributes and traits, ultimately, I don't know if I liked all of them. I don't know if I liked all, like, I don't know if I needed to see Letitia under, like, being bitter that her, you know, her low colored friends didn't want to sympathize with her because she was also being oppressed as a white woman. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, ultimately, if that helped me understand her as a character when I could already see those, some, like, all those traits were already there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know if it really did anything for me specifically. And seeing Interlude be reduced to, well, you know, she's going to carry on the revolution. It was like, well, I kind of got that. You know, like, I got that from her interactions with Robin. And I think Rami's was probably the most interesting. I don't know if say the most interesting, but I could understand why he was the way he was in his Interlude differently than the way I could understand in Robin's perspective. And I, I guess if you were just going to have that one-off chapter with Rami, it makes sense to give the other two characters a one-off. Um, so I don't I don't hate the book. It doesn't drag anything down for me. And I, I, 
and I'm hesitant to say that it ruins everything, that it ruins everything, because it could just be my singular look at this. And maybe when, specifically when Black women read this, they're not going to have that same initial gut reaction that I had. And that's really one of the bigger takeaways that I had from the last part of the book, because the building up of the revolution, I was like, because for so long in the book, I was like, where's this revolution? Like, y'all are claiming there's a revolution. And for a minute, I thought the revolution was going to be theoretical. And it was quickly, it was quickly realized I was, I was, it was not a theoretical revolution. The, the revolution was very much a tangible thing. And the path in which the story wound its way to revolution, I thought made sense. And I do think that all of the death in the book um, was meaningful in a way that I think in a lot of other dark academic texts, it's not. I think that, I said this in my Goodreads review, but so many dark academia books think that you have to kill a character. And the character just has to die because somebody died in the secret history. And I don't think that when the character died in the secret history, it, was, it actually worked uh, for me because I thought that that character was the most interesting of the character, despite the fact that that character was the most reprehensible human in the story. They were still the most interesting. And so them dying, why? Um, <laughs> so I, I get that people want people to die in a dark academia, but I feel like the character deaths here were laced into a larger, more expansive plot about these discussions on empire, on colonialism, on the way in which that colonialism is antithetical to its own aims at times and how it really is a snake eating its own tail in the ways that it will. It doesn't matter if it's devouring something that it actually needs to continue to sustain itself because as long as it is big it can continue to do like it was it's too big to fail you know like that was the the idea was that we were going to create this institution that uh, from the outside appears too big to fail and too big to rise up against and to resist and that's what they did they were they were resisting and so it was it, it was really interesting to read about and I really it just it struck every nerve that it needed to strike with me. And I think that I've said everything I need to say in my initial gut reactions to the end of the book. So I'm going to come back in a little bit, give you my final thoughts, let the non-spoiler people back into the video. And yeah, that's all I got. I'm going to go get my coffee. Thanks for sitting with me. And I'll see you guys in a little bit. I feel like... I feel like my hair is like in a hot mess. But we're just going to get over it. We're going to do the thing. I'm going to talk to you guys about Babel. Because if you were watching this part, then you have decided that you don't want to be spoiled. So I'm not going to give you any of my in-depth thoughts. I'm going to wait for you to go back and watch that. But um, this book was it was a masterpiece. It was, it was everything that I wanted it to be. And I think it's everything... That if you like books like I like books, then this is going to be everything that you want it to be. Now, on the off chance that you have not already seen my series discussion on the Poppy War, I feel like I do need to say that I did not love every book in that series. The first two books in that series to me were just pretty average. They were okay. I gave them two stars. But it was the last book, The Burning God, that I really like. Because I think that in The Burning God, all of the commentary that R.F. Kuang wanted to do she was able to accomplish. She was able to really dig into the meat and potatoes of the commentary that she wanted to share. And I think that that was what made that book so good. And it was, you know, you did need the first two books to get to that point, but the commentary there was, it was amazing. And that commentary, that way that she was able to just like really cleave into the middle of a conversation and explore all of these nuances was made is that's what made me so interested to pick up Babel. I didn't want to read Babel just because Rebecca wrote it, but I wanted to read it because how she handles these sort of serious larger world implications that a lot of other fantasy authors are just like whatever about. And I have to say that Rebecca did not disappoint. She was able to really delve into these conversations surrounding class, surrounding colonization, surrounding the empire at that time and what it meant to be 
uh, a part of the empire and how as part of the empire you are crushed by the empire and how that crushing is what sustains the empire. It was just layers on layers of nuance, layers on layers of everything. I said this a, n- a number of times, but so often I find that dark academia just doesn't hit because of how they approach a certain topic and how so much of at least recent mar- dark academia that has been like flooding the market is we aren't really looking at the way that class is stratified within an academic setting. We're not looking at how race is stratified within through the lens of academia like you use academia as the lens in which to have like these larger conversations because of how academia reflects society at large and some microcosm of all of those larger discussions that you can have like these really serious discussions and it's just become this romanticization of like exhaustion and then somebody has to get murdered or a dead body has to appear and the surrounding mystery or the surrounding cover-up of this dead body is what really subsumes the whole story and it's not these you know using the microcosm to explore society at large and it took a really long time for a body to drop in this book but I do think that the way that the body dropped in this book it was part of that larger conversation it was part of a larger discussion of that microcosm in relation to society at large and that's what I want that's what I needed and for so long in the book I was like I don't see where the revolution is happening and I was really nervous that this was not going to work as a standalone novel but overall at the end of the day when we finally got to the Oxford translators revolution all of the building blocks that we needed to get there they were present And I didn't find that any of it felt forced or rushed or that there was time wasted. There is one aspect that I've already discussed, if you didn't skip over the spoiler section, um, that is like my biggest hang up about this book and the thing that I'm most looking forward to discussing with other readers. I'm not going to get into that now, but there is, just because I'm saying this is the best book I've ever read in my entire life on this planet, just because this is the best book I've read in 2022, just because I don't think that I'm ever going to read a book that made me experience the roller coaster of emotions the way that this book made me feel, there are still things that I don't think are perfect. And maybe they are just a gut reaction to a thing that could be just a me thing. Um, but still, this is a book that I think everybody should read. And I already know people are going to read it. Everybody was excited for this before there was a synopsis, before you got that fan art, before we saw how pretty the Waterstone Special Edition was going to be, before we got to see all of these like physical arcs going out into the world. I know that this is a book that people were already hyped for because people really love the Poppy War trilogy. But this is a book you, you re- even if you did not like that, I think that there is a a chance that you might like this but this book was just stunning and if you've made it theme of this video you're great thank you for getting here don't forget to leave your thoughts and opinions down below in the comment section i'll see all of you guys again really soon with another video but um until then and until next time